In 1912, coal was discovered in the hills of Spring Canyon, Utah. As a result, Frederick A. Sweet founded the Standard Coal Company. The organization of Standard Coal Company in 1913 led to the opening of several underground coal mines in Spring Canyon. As the mines grew, so did the need for space for miners. In anticipation of this need, the Standard Coal Company established the city of Standardville. Standardville itself was established in 1912. It was quite the marvel on its own for a small mining town in the early 1900s. Its name originates from its well-manicured lawns, landscaped bushes, planted poplar trees, and generally well-organized and aesthetic appearance. Thus, it was named the Standard for Utah coal mining towns. The Denver and Rio Grande Railroad had a line in the city of stores that was extended westward to Standardville. The arrival of the railroad allowed other improvements to be made to the city and resulted in construction of several other structures. Because of the growth of the mines and the railroad, Standardville's population eventually increased to around 550 residents. The town had steam-heated apartments, a hospital, tennis courts, an elementary school, a butcher shop, and a large company store. In 1923, the state coal mine inspector described Standardville in some detail. The town of Standardville is a model mining town. A modern sewer system has been installed throughout the town. Lawns and trees have been planted where the physical conditions would permit. All houses are well built, and many of them are modern in every respect. An apartment house, equipped with electric ranges, was built just last year. Also, a hotel, which affords comfortable quarters for men, has been built. A small but very well-equipped modern hospital and an amusement hall of steel and hollow tile construction, where the best motion pictures are shown regularly, contribute to the advantages of this community. When the railroad arrived in Standardville, this allowed the addition of a coal tipple and other mine facilities. By February of 1914, the mines were producing 200 tons of coal per day. In only one year, that production had increased to around 1,000 tons of coal per day. By 1915, there were 143 men working in the mines. In 1915 alone, the mine produced 149,453 tons of coal. The railroad facilitated transport of coal to market. A stage line also ran workers from the city of Helper, a city approximately five miles to the southeast of Standardville. The mines in Standardville had a history of friction between the company owners and the miners. Strikes were frequent and often would result in violence. In June of 1922, one such strike escalated so much that one mine guard was killed. One other miner and the mine superintendent were wounded when miners attacked a train that was bringing in strike breakers. When Governor Charles R. Maybe learned of the violent strikes taking place in Standardville, he activated the National Guard and sent troops to the Carbon County Coal District to enact and enforce martial law. This ended the violent strikes. The Standardville mines were considered generally safe, or as safe as coal mines could be anyways. On February 6, 1930, this would change. 29 men were working as normal when a pocket of fire damp gas was ignited, causing an explosion. This explosion immediately killed 20 of the workers. The exact cause of the explosion is unknown, but it's largely believed to have been caused by sparks from a cutting machine or an electrical spark from a trolley. Rescue workers were sent to attempt to save the nine surviving miners, but a secondary cave-in took the lives of three of the rescuers. The explosion generated a large amount of carbon monoxide gas. The nine surviving miners were able to prevent carbon monoxide poisoning by creating a seal with a canvas tarp and piles of coal rockfall. This disaster dealt a heavy blow to the community in Standardville. It wasn't the end of the city, nor the mines, however. The mines continued to produce more than 2,000 tons per day by 1932. The mines continued to produce significant quantities of coal. Despite this, the Standard Coal Company started to see financial struggles. 
In January of 1939, the company couldn't meet the payroll demands. 265 miners unanimously came together and voted to work only for food in a desperate attempt to prevent the mine from closing. This last-ditch effort failed, however, and the Standard Coal Company was sold in foreclosure on November 3, 1939. The company was reorganized as Standard Coal Incorporated, and coal shipments resumed by December 1, 1939. With the outbreak of World War II, demand for coal soared. These new markets provided substantial opportunity to Standard Coal Incorporated. By the end of the war, railways and energy producers began transitioning from coal to oil and natural gas fuel sources. Despite this change, Standard Coal was still operating the Standard Mine, the Spring Canyon Mine, and the Royal Mine. By 1950, everything began to decline for the mines. The mines closed, which resulted in the schools, stores, and hospitals closures. The mine office remained until the 70s. Finally, Standardville was unincorporated and sold back to the public for nearly nothing. Any wooden buildings were scrapped for lumber and relocated to Helper or Price. Larger stone or tile buildings were demolished. The mine portals were dynamited or caved in. Standardville, as it had once been, was gone. All that remains of Standardville today are the foundations of buildings, the foundations of the coal tipple, the miner's bathhouse, the mutual building, caved in mine portals, tailings piles, a bitumen processing plant, and traces of other mining infrastructure. Much of the property is owned by Blackhawk Energy and two families today. I'd like to extend a special thanks to the Foy family for allowing me out of their property and easements in the area. These effectively made the video possible. If you liked this video, check out the other videos on my Ghost Towns and Abandoned Places playlist. Subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Until next time, my name is Mike. Thanks for watching.